Part 1. Here a student called Joanna, telling her friend about an arts festival, which is being held in the city where they are studying. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Hi, Joanna. Where have you been? Hi, Dave. I had to go into college to return a DVD I'd borrowed from the library. Oh, right. But while I was there, I got some information about the City Arts Festival that starts next week. Oh, yeah. I saw a poster advertising it somewhere. Yeah. And I picked up this leaflet from the library. It gives you the website address. So as I was there, I logged on to get more information. Actually, although they've got the full programme of events fixed now, you can't book online, which seems strange. There's a number to phone, though. Hmm. And are there student discounts? I guess so, but I didn't notice. Anyway, there are three things I'd like to see. An Italian film, a rock concert and an art exhibition. Oh. <laughs> the exhibition's free and you don't need to book, so I'll definitely go to that. But I'm going to get tickets for the film in case they sell out. Mm, good idea. You can always buy concert tickets at the door, because that's in a really big hall. Right. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. So, when does the festival actually start? Well, it's usually held the first week of October, but it's earlier this year for some reason. The opening night is September the 20th, and events go on till the end of the month. Hmm. And have you got that phone number? Yeah, it's here. Uh, look, it's 0967 990 OK, I'll write it down. 0967 990 Thanks. I thought the local council made a profit from the festival, but it says here that there's a commercial sponsor. It's a local bank. I didn't know that. Neither did I. What other events have they got on? Um, as well as the art exhibitions and stuff that's open every day, there are special events each day. Like on Monday, there's a musical in the City Hall. Yeah. That's only £3.65 for students. Mm, I think I'll give that a miss. I've got football training on Mondays, but I'm free on Wednesday. There's a jazz band on then, and that's only £2.50 for students. Sounds good. Is that in the City Hall too? We could go. Well, I'm busy actually, but it's at the Sports Centre if you're interested. Oh, right. Thursday's the cheapest event, 
Only £1.25 for students. And it's on in the library. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Probably the college choir. <laughs> Actually, no. They've not been asked, apparently. Oh. No, it's a poetry evening. Hmm. Isn't there any modern dance on anywhere? On Friday. That's at the college. It's quite expensive, though. £15 for adults and £12.75 for students. Oh, yes, that is a lot. If I'm going to spend that much, I'd prefer to go out on Saturday. Yeah, me too. But on Saturday night, there isn't live music or a party or anything. Just the fireworks in the city park. And that's only £1.50. Yeah, that'd be good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two first-year engineering students discussing their project on devices which have been specially designed for use in developing countries. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and decide which four planned developments are mentioned. Hi Aileen, thanks for coming. No problem. We've got our presentation coming up on Tuesday, so we need to get everything prepared now. Yeah, so we're agreed that we're going to concentrate on these two devices which have particularly helped people in developing countries. Yes. And we'll present the information in the form of a table, so it'll be really clear for non-specialists. We'll have three columns, you know, using the headings we discussed in the last seminar. OK, I've got those here. I'll make notes. So, let's start with the clockwork radio and how it works. We'll obviously say how it's powered, i.e. that it's wound up. Yeah, and we'll also need to explain how the energy is stored. OK. In a spring. Fine. Keep it simple. But we also need to say that the thing which makes the mechanism so special is the inclusion of a gearbox, you know, which makes it possible to release energy extremely slowly. Mm. And that means that it can operate for a long time with minimal effort. OK. Now, the next section is what are its benefits? I suppose we just need to emphasise that it costs a lot less than radios which use batteries. And if we want to, we can explain that these can cost as much as a week's wages in some parts of the world. Absolutely. And related to that, of course, is the fact that people don't have to depend on buying anything in a store, which in remote rural areas is really important. Mm. And then in the developments column, I think the most important thing we need to say is that the combination of the wind-up mechanism with a solar cell means that during the day it runs on the sun's energy and you only have to wind it up when it's dark, which makes it a much more attractive option. And that's probably that for the radio. Yep. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20.
You will now listen to the second part of the talk. So we'll then move on to the solar box cooker. And again, let's keep the description of the mechanism very simple. We need to say that it uses sunlight rather than conventional fuels to cook food. But we also need to explain two elements of why it's so efficient. Yeah. The fact that sun's rays enter through a plastic cover.、Mm, better call it a lid. I thought it was made of glass. Mm, not according to my research.、Mm, okay. And then we just say that light is transformed into heat, and because it has a longer wavelength, means that it gets trapped, and so it cooks the food. Good, right. And then where do we begin on the advantages? <laughs> There's so many. I suppose we have to begin with the fact that you no longer need to cut down trees, which brings a whole raft of other benefits in its turn.、Mm, sure. And related to that, I think we need to say that because dung is no longer needed as a fuel for cooking, it can be used as a fertilizer, which leads to better harvests. And then there's the fact that there is absolutely no smoke. I was reading somewhere that there's a huge incidence of lung complaints, especially among women and children who have to breathe in smoke from conventional cookers. So that's another plus point. Yep. And then we need to say something about the way cookboxes have been improved. I think we can emphasise the fact that a reflector is often added at an angle to the lid to maximise the amount of light entering. Yes, good point. And also, I read about the fact that the floor or base of the box is raised, which improves heat retention. Oh, and I think we should mention the fact that many of the new boxes have a sloping or inclined lid, which increases the surface area to capture the sun's rays. Yes, that's a good point to finish on. I think. So I'll write up that table on an OHT if you like, and we're all set for our presentation. Yes, great. If there's anything else that you think we should discuss. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear two students called Jimmy and Kathy talking to their tutor about the current research paper. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Before we start, Jimmy and Kathy, thanks for coming in today to talk about your current research paper. Well, I will also give you some suggestions for your future presentation later. That's great. Okay, I've read the introductory chapter, and so far I like. Where you're going with your research, you two? Thanks. What did you think of the procedure section? I haven't got there yet. I'll get to that and the results and discussion section in a bit. Oh, if you haven't read the rest, are you just saying you like the introduction? No, the layout is really well done. You have each section clearly marked and have the header and footer perfectly formatted. And your title page is right on the money. A lot of students have trouble with that one. To be honest, we did refer a lot to the example we received in class. That's good to do for spacing and layout, as long as you're not also copying the information. The background information is a little sparse, though. You may want to add to it. You think so? 
I was more worried about whether I had enough data. You definitely need more background information. I would think about finding some more online articles or doing more research in the campus library. That's a good idea. We can go tomorrow. I find it too tough finding the subject matter in the online journal database. I also like being able to flip through the physical journal as opposed to trying to scroll down on a computer. Me too. Oh, I almost forgot. I've included all of my citations in the abstract. But could you help me with the bibliography? I should be using a bibliography, right? Not an appendix. Sure, I can help with that. Yes, for this type of scientific research paper, list all sources that you cite in the body of your paper in a bibliography. Go to the website I gave you last time to see the exact way to list each source. Okay, thanks. I'll do that. We still have a lot of things to fix up. Yeah. But there's a lot of good stuff here to work with. So enough about the paper. How is the presentation going? Well, it's all right. I'm going to go try out the new presentation software while Jimmy's working on the bibliography. Yeah, we are hoping to make an animation of an actual pump, but still have a lot to learn about how to do that. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Who would have thought before we started this project that we would be able to recreate the motion of a pump? This stuff is just so interesting. So glad to hear it. Yeah, I am glad I took engineering this semester. I would definitely like to keep up with it. You know, there's an organization called the Machine Engineer Society. You should look into joining it. You would need to score well in your engineering class to qualify, but I think you can do it. Hmm, interesting. I will definitely check it out. I would really like to get in contact with some professionals in the engineering field to find out more. I don't really know anyone in the field now, though. I think if you keep meeting people in your classes and professors, you'll you'll be able to get in contact with some really helpful people. Well said, Jimmy. If engineering pumps is something you both are specifically interested in, make sure you stay up to date on new developments. In fact, you could visit the local water treatment facility periodically to see what new developments are going on. Hmm, that may be a good way to get some practical experience. Well, I don't think they would let you handle any equipment by just visiting the facility. If you really want to get your hands dirty, so to speak, I would recommend instead seeking a summer internship. Wow, you have so many helpful suggestions for getting a leg up. Now, if only you could tell me how to get my work published. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Well, honestly, all you really need to do is, once you have a dissertation, present it, present it often and to many audiences. And once you get feedback, adjust it. You'll get published one day. Wow, this meeting has been truly inspiring. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk given by Jim Allen. He is going to share some of his findings of his research. Now you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we'll be hailing from Jim Allen, who will be sharing some of the findings of his research project from last term. Jim. Thanks. Well, to start with, a little bit of background about the project. As you can see, our title is something that is relevant to everybody in this part of the world. Water safety. These days, there's a lot more to water safety because of the increasing number and range of boats and other things people use on public waterways. I'd become interested, through reports on radio, about the number of incidents involving small power boats and individual watercraft, such as jet skis. It seemed to me that because these craft were essentially recreational and didn't require licenses to use, there was very little opportunity to influence the users towards being safety conscious. So, I decided to make this the focus of the project. For the research, we mainly relied upon talking to people, asking them questions in preference to using a written questionnaire. We interviewed a wide range of people at a number of popular swimming locations over two consecutive weekends and asked them what they'd observed or experienced themselves. The respondents were both male and female, but the men were just slightly in the majority. We were pleased with their willingness to talk about the subject and all told interviewed 145 people over the two weekends. So, what were the findings? As you can see, 86% of people reported having had some type of problem. A surprisingly large percentage, 27%, commented that they had found it necessary to shout at an offending powerboat. But the main type of problem was the deafening sound that some of the boats made. On occasions, this led to swimmers deciding to move to another location. So what strategies did people adopt to ensure their own comfort and safety? Let's have a look at the figures. First, it was noticeable that there were often distinctly different answers between men and women. It was mainly the women, for example, who said they should try to choose places where boats couldn't go, whereas it was usually the men who said you shouldn't have to move if you were there first, so you should shout at them if necessary. Both men and... Oh, sorry, no, it was women who said you should call the authorities if the situation gets too dangerous or the powerboat drivers are acting irresponsibly. Then, I had thought it would be mainly women, but both sexes made the point that above all, it's important to get children away from any possible danger. Men were very aware that jet skis could be unpredictable in inexperienced hands. They also made the point that it's much safer to have your car nearby and clearly visible to any watercraft if you're swimming in a relatively remote spot. Finally, wearing visible clothing, men didn't think it was quite as important as women, but both gave it a high safety rating. When we asked them what they thought the government should do to help solve the problem, That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.